Hello to you friends. This is the Dama on Air number four. It's a classic like the other ones, a classic session of questions and answers on early Theravada Buddhism. And there's uh, six questions today. Uh, but first the normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened is the blessed Buddha, a very, fullständig complete, a perfect set of lust, and resilient Buddha. The six questions. Uh, the first one is a follow-up on the, the last one about how to establish continuous unbroken mindfulness uh, sati and the sutta f or the speech of the Buddha uh, used for that is the Satipasana Sutta is in Manjima Nikaya number 10 and then one person has asked uh, how to use this in, in meditation is it supposed to use in one session or in more than one session I just like to say that This uh, speech, uh, which is the tenth speech of the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, the book looked like this. I can highly recommend it. Uh, the middle length discourse of the Buddha, Majjhima Nikaya. It's number 10 in that. Then there's another section with a, a And a complete copy, a little shorter, uh, only missing the Four Noble Truth in the end, is in this, is the connected discourses of the Buddha, Samyutta Nikaya. There's a whole Satipatthana Samyutta uh, in this in this one. This is also worth studying. There's just we, if we go for the text, there's five of these text collection at this size, roughly 800,000 pages. This is the study material necessary for any Buddhist to read before they die. This is basically all the speeches of the Buddha and his enlightened monks to the lay people and to each other. Uh, it starts with the Dika Nikaya, the long speeches. They are 30 to 50 pages. Then the is a middle length Majjhima Nikaya. They are 10, 20 pages. Then there's Samyutta Nikaya. They are two, three pages. Then, then there's the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical uh, discourses or numerical sayings. Just come a new translation here, which I'm studying. I can recommend also, translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And then that Uh, there's a Kutaka Nikaya. It's a short collection of texts, but actually it's fairly large in, in volume because it says there's a Jatakas, the Buddhist life stories, uh, prior rebirth stories, uh, and various other texts. So to study this, usually it takes, you cannot go through such a, a volume here in less than a year. Usually it takes more than a year, one and a half, two years. There's five of them. This gives at least five years, six years, seven years, usually around 10 years of study. So it's a page-wise and study-wise a full university study, but it's worth the effort because you one cannot come out of this study uh, not being a, a f seriously advanced Buddhist, actually, because the translations are so good today that one will be able to understand a lot Maybe not all, but a lot. Uh, one will be safe uh, and sound in this life. Doesn't mean one doesn't have chance for downfall, but uh, at least one has a chance of getting around the sharp corners. So it's crucial to get this text right. They are also available freely on the internet to a large extent, but not to a complete extent. So I recommend buy these modern translations 
they're very good. They're very good. Okay, the Satipasana Sutta. What did I do myself actually? It's something like uh, 10, 30 pages around that. Uh, so I studied very closely and then I summarized it with taking only the headings or key points and I put them down on paper. And then I compressed this paper, keep compressing it until I could have it on two or four pages. So I could print it on one page and then I have another page. And then every Sunday I'll go through all these points. It'll take a whole day, basically. Uh, from morning to evening. Because if you're kind of like little uh, and unconcentrated, you kind of like miss the points. But it's very, very good to do that. Why so? Because this single speech contains all of the Dhamma in one speech. So you have more or less all of Buddhism in one speech. And all of the techniques also, all the meditation objects is mentioned there. So there's everything you can say in one speech. So it's extremely compressed and therefore it's very good to, to learn so you can recite it for yourself. Not the sutta, but the headings, the summary. Huh? Just go through it inside your head. I'll do it doing walking meditation, walking up and down, up and down, up and down. Then I'll do it sometimes also while sitting, I'll recite it inside my head. Then you have this page with you. you. You can do it when you go up and down. You have this page with you. If you forget something, you can just look. You have only, there's only one page. It's on page one or on the opposite page. So you have one notice. Then, so then you have kind of like the whole, the whole thing in one basket in your head. And that's a toolbox you need to go further on because then you can focus all the meditation methods that then you take one meditation method out usually it's best assigned by a monk but can also be assigned by a, a lay meditator which has some experience or by yourself and then you can focus on this meditation method so when you say is this atipatana sutta in one setting or one session or in many sessions it's actually both is in, in one session, then you kind of like, this you have to work on in the start until you have memorized all the headings and know the mechanisms. Know it in and out as your own back door, as your own house. As you, you should know it so well as, as like you're in your house, you can, if you turn off the lights, you can still find your way in the house, huh? Down the basement, out to the refrigerator and the toilet and vice versa. So also you should, should, should do with this talk, you should, you should be able to find your way on it in the dark of remembrance, forgetting it. When you've done that, you can go further on to the next stage and then you take out one meditation method at a time and practice that selectively. And choose two or three as your main meditation objects and then and continue on from there. They should be ideally be assigned by a monk and and I can do it for you if you like. If we, but then I'll have to know you a little bit about you doing an interview, uh, either on Skype or if you come here or something like that. Because uh, these meditation objects they work best if they are uh, kind of like tailored to the specific uh, defilements of that particular individual. So it's like you have, if you have one disease, you get one medicine. If you have another disease, you get another medicine. So the medicine is specific for the, the, the kind of disease one has. That also goes for mental diseases, mental defilements. They take a special kind of soap, a special kind of cleaning, a special kind of antidote to be cured, to be released. And this is the specificity of these 40 meditation objects, which are in, mentioned by the Buddha in, in classic early Theravada Buddhism. I hope this uh, uh, answers these questions. The second question is, uh, can there be a real love between partners? Or is it all about attachment? 
and again yes and no uh, first what is love in the conventional sense of the word uh, one has to be a little bit realistic about it. this passion has the main drive of this passion is uh, a sexual drive so uh, basically uh, a sex uh, exchanging sex between partners is uh, giving each other pleasure and usually you can see in many relationships if the sexual life doesn't work well if uh, one partner cannot satisfy the other or vice versa then they will split up sooner or later and that's a good in indication that this is true the sexual drive is the main drive of keeping these two partners together I just like it to note uh, <laughs> because this is one of the sayings of the Buddha that's uh, around these partnerships and also friendships actually on, on, the, on the long end that all meetings with individuals that follow along they end in separation if not before then at death usually long before huh? so what what's the point of meeting of joining up in the first place if it ends in separation this is because of impermanence basically so that's a kind of like overall uh, view of this partnership uh, issue uh, no partner can save you you have to do it yourself uh, you, yes one can follow along if one can find friendship and that's a real love if usually between partners also between mar married partners spouses they will develop something else besides the sexual exchange which is actually a commercial enterprise where uh, I give you pleasure then you give me pleasure or I give you pleasure you give me money or I give you pleasure you give me social security or I give you pleasure you give me something else so it's kind of like an exchange of something and it's often not really low people say I, I love this and that uh, person and then what's really going on is that they have a commercial enterprise they are swapping things they are swa sw swapping valuables pleasure for something else or pleasure with pleasure pleasure one kind of pleasure with another kind of pleasure that's the most more realistic view on it there's nothing uh, wrong with swapping or <laughs> commercial enterprises if you just know it if you just know it and you're aware of it it doesn't have this romantic <laughs> illusion that you you love somebody or they love you that's not the case that's not the case the real love can from a Buddhist point of view has nothing to do with sex and also has nothing to do with the exchange it's not a swapping of something not at all the real love in Buddhism is called metta and that's basically come from the root word mitta which means friend so metta can be uh, best translated in my opinion to friendliness or goodwill and this is something that you can have with all beings you can have it with your dog friendliness with your dog and with the rats outside and with the insect and with all beings and with your mom so basically it's transferable to anybody any other live being and it's very advantageous to do that so I can say from this point of view I love everybody every morning for one and a half hour not only all humans but all conscious beings not only on the planet earth but the, in, in the entire cosmos I love all of them unconditionally and that's very very nice <laughs> I can recommend it so this is metta to do metta unrestricted that doesn't make any difference huh? whether it's your partner or not your partner whether it's your kid or another's kid whether it's a human or an animal whatever conscious being it is past present or future small or big ugly or beautiful high or low thin or thick green brown yellow with polka dots or whatever these beings are characterized by internally or externally physically or mentally you can have goodwill towards them 
Why is to see this positive aspect that knowing that inherently because they are conscious they will all have they all have this seed in them one day to be enlightened one day to be perfect they already have it i don't say they already are perfect because that's obviously not true but they have it in them this buddha nature the seed to enlightenment and that's that's enough i use that myself as a point of reference so yes now they are terrorists or now they are killers now they are rapists now they are pedophiles and now they are terrible in this and that or that way but no 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 i i love them anyway because that's good for them for me for everybody that's advantageous that's kusala that's clever that's unsurpassable that's blazing this metta metta parami the perfection of mind by friendliness so uh can there be friendliness between partners yes i can and if you call that love then they also can be love but what is called love conventionally is more about clinging to pleasure one or other count usually the sexual pleasure which we come down to it is something usually sensation around the mouth sensations of, uh, around the hand where you touch the partner and sensation around the genitals that's what one is clinging to why what one is clinging to that because that's the highest pleasure ordinary beings can get besides maybe drug induced pleasure but uh, since it is so they cling very uh, rigorously to it and have very large fear of losing it and right there jealousy starts come in and jealousy can be very very forceful and very hateful and even it can be a killer can make people kill each other or kill others huh so there one see that this clinging is dangerous it has two sides it's self destructive and i repeat it's not clinging to a person it's not loving a person it's clinging to a particular kind of pleasure and nothing else then these two also they can they can be all kind of mixtures so you have a you have a spouse you have a, a well functioning sex life with the spouse then there can be friendliness also and there can be metaphysical aspects of this uh also during this the the intercourse of unification where the ego kind of like evaporate uh and you cannot kind of like determine who's who uh, this is called tantric sex very tantalizing but still uh, thereby by also uh, very uh, very attachment and addiction creating uh but interesting from a philosophical point of view because as the ego when the fusion of the two consciousnesses during unification and it doesn't need to do have have actually i don't uh it doesn't need to be during a sex act usually it just has to be skin contact uh then there can suddenly be unification of the two consciousness in a very interesting way where the ego seems to evaporate out of out, out of the equation but that's another issue but just just say that uh friendliness usually it is so but by spouses if you see over a li- lifetime uh the sexual arousement will go down because one's body is decaying is at the height when one is 17 years old and then when one is 87 then one looks bad and smells bad so one is not very sexually attractive at the old age of life but there something else has replaced the sexual attraction what is usually called love and passion this kind of insanity when you say you say you fall in love no those is you say you fall in love <laughs> you're falling right there in love you're not rising you don't say i fly in love i fall in love and that's because one fall down into this clinging process which is very very painful just think of all this this uh, these uh, uh, divorces public or not they people are very very hit by it i have to consult 
many di- recently divorced uh, human beings, both females and males, and they are like hit by a truck, mentally speaking. They felt like some somebody has taken their right arm and pulled it off. And this is just an, an expression of that, that the cling has been very forceful in their mind to this partner or whatever this partner could deliver, both from sexual pleasure, but also by from company, uh, social status, uh, a family association. There's many issues. But nevertheless, what I would call real love is the thing, if we say, and I've seen it uh, between spouses, not so often actually, but I have seen some, as a doctor, seen some, some people who really loved each other at the end of their life as, for example, 70 years or 80 years old. And there was some deep kind of friendship and goodwill and a mutual understanding where the, the partners can usually read the, each other's thoughts. They can finish each other's sentences easily. They know where the other person is in the house. And this, this kind of uh, partnership, I would call the real love, it has nothing to do with sex. But it doesn't necessarily uh, has to be something that is between partners. It can be between all kinds of conscious beings. And it should be cultivated as such and also separated from the physical part of, of sex. Because these two things are two different things. Sex is pleasure. Meta is love, real love. And that is possible with your spouse and with all other beings. With all our beings, I would say uh, when you expand, uh, and it's not something that you should do up in your intellect, in your head. It's something that you should get down here to the heart. And it was difficult for me actually in the start to kind of like <coughs> get it from the head, from the intellect to the heart, something emotional. And uh, when you get it to the heart, you will feel that that the love that you feel for your spouse also goes up. When you, if you can love everybody, all beings, even the terrorists, you can love. Then you can. It's, then it's much more easy to love your spouse because uh, apparently this, your spouse is probably not a terrorist. Huh? They may be, but they're usually not. Not very much, at least. <laughs> anyway, so. I hope that's how I answered the question. Sex is not love. Conventional no- love is not love. That is clinging. Love is possible, but it's something else. What is it? It is metta. It is a four brahma viharas. Metta, friendliness, karuna, pitiful compassion, mudita, mutual joy, that you, are, you rejoice in other beings' success, and equanimity, upekka serenity, imperturbability. This is, this four Brahma Viharas uh, increases the outflow uh, of goodwill. They are kind of like pinning each other up. Uh, but the meta really kind of like starts a ball and also ends the ball, uh, the party. And it's, it's, it's a blazing thing. The Buddha, he get, went as far as saying that metta, whatever you do of worldly merit, if you make hospitals or vaccines or give billions of dollars away, it's not, even whatever you can do of this worldly merit, is not one sixteenth worth the release of mind by friendliness. Metta vimutti. Not it's one sixteenth. So uh, this says something about this how how good it really is. It doesn't seem so. It seems kind of like insignificant. That goodwill is yes, it's kind of like small romantic thing that you should try to be a good person. No, it's something really substantial. You cannot give your away to this release of mind by friendliness. You cannot do it. It's not possible. Basically, it can take you to the Brahma level, uh, which is above the sense pleasure level, level 16 and above in the 31 levels of, 
of existence in Buddhist cosmology. They are uh, giving cannot take you. So it's for meditators. This release of mind can come fairly high. So it's a very significant t- thing I can recommend. Recommend warmly. <laughs> I hope this uh, resolves the issue of real love versus uh, clinging and attachments to sense pleasure between partners or between all beings. The question, third question is, have you done any uh, guided meditations? Again, yes and no. I've done some uh, meditation advice and explanation, but they are not uh, really guided meditations in that sense, uh, that uh, concept usually is uh, understood. And I will do some, it's a very good idea, and I th- thank you for the question, because it's a very good idea. What I have done is uh, some explanations on my SoundCloud profile, which I can uh, hard, uh, highly recommend, uh, also on breathing meditation. And uh, I'll give the, it here. You just search my name, Piku Samahita, and then SoundCloud. Then there's a set, uh, it's called Early Buddhism. And then there is, I think, four or five that qualifies as an explanation to a guided meditation, but it's not a fully guided meditation. Uh, this I can uh, highly recommend. Uh, you can take, download them and ha- have them on, on your mobile phone and then hear them in the bus and so on. Many people do that, especially here in, in Asia, when they're driving on the highway in Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever, they, they're listening to, to these ones. They are, of course, best uh, used with headphones. Huh? Also, if you sit, especially if you if you hear them while sitting on the pillow, uh, that's the best. But I thank you for the question because this of guided meditations make this with SoundCloud on SoundCloud, so one can have them in the ears while sitting on the pillow. It's a very good idea, and I think I will make all the classical. Uh, meditation objects uh, as guided meditations and I will name them like that guided meditation uh, but I'll start uh, working as, as as soon as I can thank you for the question uh, then the f- next question number four is what is Yuniso Manasikara uh, it's a special technical expression in, in Buddhism I call it rational attention Yuniso means womb, uh, uterus, womb, where the baby is born inside. Huh? Manasikara, mano, mano, mind, sikra, doing, uh, the womb of what mind is doing. Uh, if you go into the commentary system, you see it is attention directed specifically to the cause and effect of the given aspect. So, let, for example, we have to take what's the cause of feeling, Vedana. That's contact. Pasa. What's the cause of contact? That's the six senses. So, it is this because the whole Buddhist and also modern science actually is built on this concept or mechanism of cause and effect. If you have the cause, if this arises, then that arises also. If this goes away, that goes away also. So they are they are coupled because there is causality between factor A and factor B. This also entails if you deliver A, you also get B. If you deliver the cause, you get the effect. If you remove the cause, the effect also goes away. So it's kind of like a, a problem solver. But it's just Samopala. Dependent co-arising. It's a core concept of Buddhism and modern science also. That there is causality. That things can cause each other to emerge, to come into being. To arise. And thereby also to cease if they miss Usually, 
if one this is a monofactorial explanation that a has only one a uh, b has only one cause and that's a usually it's a network but when mentioned the causality in early Buddhism one is aware of this network it's explained in the Apidama but for simplicity and also for 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 remembrance it's good to have one single cause to one single effect Knowing it's not so, because if uh, this this was the cause, this was the cause of that, then what is the effect of that? So it's a it's a network, it's a chain of causality, uh, just like a, a a domino, kind of like falling. One falls, then the last falls, but in between there's a lot of other domino uh, breaks falling, huh? And furthermore, is uh, these chains of causality are interconnected with other chains of causality, so it's a network of causality. But nevertheless, the last cause or the main cause in the chain is what we call the proximate cause, and this cause is what we usually focus upon, because then you, if you know that, you can track down further the network. Let's take some examples. Uh, that is uh, good to to know about. So this meta, this friendliness, this goodwill, I called love before. What caused this to arise? This is when uh, instead of looking at people's uh, or uh, situations ugly or repulsive aspects, then one turns attention to the beautiful aspects, and all all things have both sides. So you are specifically, deliberately, redirecting mind to something positive, something beautiful, regarding this person, this being, this situation. Then this good will arise. What is the proximate cause of this pity, this karuna, this compassion with all being? It is that you redirect mind to seeing the helplessness of all beings seeing the helplessness of all beings if you see the helplessness of hitler of the terrorists of whoever the rapist the pedophile then you can see then immediately compassion comes up immediately you don't see them as as devils or somebody that oppose you or others or your your son or daughter or whatever they are not a danger they are as much victim for their own the defilements of their own mind as you and I and all other beings are so you see in the helplessness that they are kind of like enveloped in a mental prison that they don't know are there and therefore they cannot break out of it so this is a causality. So let's say you are in a situation, it's maybe a violent situation, and you want to induce this karunya, so you're not cruel, you don't become violent yourself, because the effect of, of compassion of karuna is to counteract cruelty, violence. Huh? So what? how to make it arise? Then you immediately come back to this, you have remembered from this speech, this seeing the helplessness of beings. Then immediately compassion arise. Because seeing the helplessness of beings is the cause of compassion to arise. If this seeing is there, seeing the helplessness is there, then compassion also comes. So it's very practical. One delivers a cause, then one gets the effect. If you don't deliver the cause because you don't know the cause, then you don't get the effect. How much ever you want it to be a good person or non-angry at that situation or non-violent in that situation. If you don't have the cause in the memory base, in the toolbox, you cannot use the tool to get it up to arise. What's the cause of mutual joy in other success? That's that you remember your, your best friend, your best companions, and then you, you rejoice in his success. And this you transfer to all other beings. You can do that. Then, what was the purpose of that? Your envy goes down, evaporate, 
Jealousy, go down, evaporate. What goes up? Contentment. A treasure and contentment goes up when you deliver this course. So you remember your best friend's come your best friend's good characteristics and, and how happy he is, how lucky he is because he has got these or that good com- circumstances. He has a good company or has a good job or a lovely wife or some lovely children or a nice house or a nice boat or whatever. And you say, ah, how good that this person has got this. Then you transfer that to whatever being is there. The same feeling the same taste you transfer to whatever it might be. For example, a, a colleague on the job that has just got the promotion that you wanted. Then you rejoice. Instead of being envious, then you rejoice in that person's uh, good fortune. Maybe even when it's not fair. And thereby you walk out the job content instead of enraged. And that's two different things. Because content when you're content with the situation, then you're happy. When you're enraged, then you're very, very unhappy. And further down the road, you do something very nasty if you're unhappy. But if you're happy, you don't do anything nasty. Further down the road from this doing, there's the, the karmic echo of whatever you have been doing. The last, uh, the cause of Upekta, the last Brahma Vihara, uh, best dwelling, you can think about it, but actually it's remembering this mnemotechnic rule, the, co- the law of karma. All beings are born of the karma, their actions, their intention and actions. They are created, formed, conditioned, shaped, restricted and adorned by their karma. They are owner, inheritor and debtor to their karma. Whatever they do, good or bad, only they will feel the resulting effect thereof. This cures any desire and it induces knowledge and vision, which is the effect of of this aloofness where you see it from above. This is very good because it it induces both undisturbedness or serenity to the external conditions, but also to your own situations. And it goes for both. It goes both for the offender, that he is owner of his karma, and also goes for you, that he's offending you, or she is offending you. It's because of your own prior karma. So it goes for both. So it's very kind of like, it puts a damping damper on the situation. Because you see, uh, whatever he or she does, that's their business, not your business. You have to stay with your own karma and endure whatever abuse that come because it's obviously a result of your own prior abuse of others and you have to just exhaust it. So just hang on in there. It's difficult, but it's very nice. So again, cause and effect. If there's this remembrance of the karmic law that this all beings are born of the karma. Then Upeka immediately takes its stance. Immediately takes its stance. Equanimity immediately takes its stance. This stance is kind of like an aloof situation where you get above it and look down upon it and say, okay, there's this and that, but there's not more than that. Don't freak out. No reason to. No need to. It's just like this and that. It's cause and chain. It's the workings of karma. Neither more nor less. On their side and on my side. So this is this uh, this turning attention to the cause and effect of all issues that you see is very good training, and that is uniso manasikra. Rational attention. I call it for, for, for need of a better word. Because ratio means that uh, you're trying to make an analysis of it. And this this is what one has to do. You can just say, for any aspect, what's the cause? Any aspect, any aspect. You should know the cause by heart. 
read up the course in the text, what the Buddha say about the course of a given phenomena. Material as mental. Look it up. Or ask me. And then we'll, when you have the course ready, then you can also ask, ah, what's the effect? So this is a crucial aspect of knowing with all phenomena. You have the phenomena here in the middle. Yeah, what's the cause and what's the effect? All phenomena has a cause and effect. Also, usually, all phenomena has more than one cause and more than one effect. But the main cause and main effect should be known for all aspects, all phenomena, all concepts. This is Shuniso Manasikra. Attention going to the womb of the matters, from where they are born, from where they arise, from where they are coming out, from the causality that kind of like lift them into being. Uniso Manasikra. Attention going to the womb. Rational attention. I think that uh, answer this question, huh? Technical issue, but a uh, good one to to keep in mind. Then a uh, very practical, very pragmatic issue is what to do with uh, rats, roaches, cockroaches, ants, mosquitoes, and all kinds of other things, uh, pests that comes into your house. Don't kill it. Don't harm it. Use live traps. Regarding rats, keep house, uh, I also had problems with rats here, keep the house ultra clean. Close all holes that are larger than uh, that you can get your your index finger through. They cannot come through a hole that your small finger can come through. But and in the index finger they can come through. So the hole should be f smaller than this one. Any they can come in, and they, if they can come in, they come in. Then keep it clean. Then no food in the garbage outside. Bring all garbage with food away. And then use live traps. Uh, there's many various kinds, but in general, the principle is. Uh, let's see where I got my drawing here. It's a trap that uh, look approximately like this. You can. There's many different marks. So you put some food there there. Then the rat comes in here. Then it steps on this one. Then this there's a hatch that goes down there. Then you have the rat inside the cage and you can take it out the forest. Bring it away at, le at least five kilometers. Otherwise it'll come back. Uh, first night I had such a one. I catch two. Actually man and wife spouse. And uh, then Next day I also catch one, and next day I also catch one. Next to so say it's strange with all these rats. And then uh, I brought them out some kind of like 500 meters away from the house in the jungle and put them out there. And then uh, it showed up. I could, I, then I start marking their tail with red paint on a small pin inside, I could, inside the cage. So I could recognize them. And uh, then I could see they came back. Sometimes they came back to the house before me. So <laughs> I gave them biscuit when they were in the cage. Uh, then they 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 think it was well, very funny. So they came back. So you have to kind of like take take them to another place. Usually now I take them to a place where there's garbage, uh, kind of like a garbage uh, throw out place, and uh, where there's also food garbage. So there's plenty of food. This means also you bring some a uh, being from one place where there's uh, not so much food to a place where there's a lot of food. That's that's good karma, so so do that. Uh, don't use poison; it's cruel. Uh, they die from bleeding. It's not it's not painful for them to die from this poison, but uh, they'll get kind of like a stroke, uh, and that's a nasty thing. Cockroaches, they one I make a use a trap, usually like this. You can see there's a bottle there, and you cut it first here. Actually, it's, when you take such a bottle like here, you should take a big cola bottle or big mineral water bottle, and then cut it around right here with a scissor, take off the lid. Then one puts on this side a little bit oil, 
thin oil, not too thick. Uh, and also in it, inside uh, mineral oil or any kind of oil that is thin, uh, vegetable oil. Then you put this lid upside down inside, just like it is here. There. And then you tape here, put tape here, all around the edges. Then in the but in down here, you can put a little bit paper like this one. Put a little bit paper, little bit bread, little bit oil uh, mixed with sugar, and also some red wine is said to be good. But you can try with different baits. Then you put it a place where they can climb onto the edge of it. Then they uh, slip on the. F uh, edge there and fall down and then they cannot climb up and back out to the tr out of the trap it's called a, a cockroach bottle and they are very effective you can catch several hundred in one night but it's important you can also put a piece of cloth up so they can climb up the piece of cloth uh, and then uh, drop down they'll go down for the food uh, and then of course clean out all the eggs that are inside uh, cockroach eggs are usually like this uh, oblong little bit long in it and a uh, brown color get the, those out us out also uh, and then you will see that your population of cockroaches will go steadily down uh, usually they will come you can s I'll give some links to on the internet uh, on uh, how to make a cockroach trap uh, from YouTube uh, and you can see some very successful results there uh, I'll give them uh, below in the comments to this video same thing one can use it with uh, mosquitoes they also red wine is very good but use a little bigger bottle you should kind of like a bottle that is this size one liter or two liter uh, all cooler bottles is very very good mosquitoes another uh, trick with mosquitoes is to use a citronella oil spray it's a vegetable oil that is very bitter in the taste it's not toxic neither for the insects nor for human beings uh, it's used also in perfume actually and it comes from a kind of grass that grows here in Selanga in huge amounts it's what we call uh, in when you use it in food it's called lemongrass uh, it's oil from lemongrass basically and this you spray on the skin it's very very effective has a good uh, smell also but a extremely bitter taste and that's why the insect don't don't like it so the insect you see the mosquito come it lands but then it goes up you you, t you taste too bad simply <laughs> nice trick so there also the mosquito goes away then there's ants ants one can also use if one is wants to protect something a, a computer or whatever can use this one also it becomes a little bit sticky but uh, it can it can go if it's very uh, chronically infested otherwise the trick is to uh, get them away by by showing them some food. Usually sugar water is very good in a flat plate so they don't drown. And then put it outside the house or wherever you want the ants to be. Then they, they will go for the sugar water and don't bother you. And then the rest you can live with. And uh, one can also have to live with. I live here in the jungle. I have to live with many kind of <laughs> animals, both inside the hermitage and outside and everywhere. And so you you have to live with it. You have to live with it. The third thing I'll say is something the Buddha he told a monk come, who he came to him and complained about this issue about mosquitoes and, and, and flies and so on. And then he said that uh, this that he should do more uh, meta meditation, meditation on universal friendliness. Because this irritation that you have is enough for comically condition the flies to attack you. And, or uh, the mosquitoes to attack you or the flies to fly around you or to bother you so this means that you, if you have your universal friendliness they will not come to you because of cause and effect because of conditionality you're conditioning the circumstances the probabilistic chance of mosquitoes attacking you this goes down because you are already friendly with the mosquito then he don't attack you that's this is very demonstrable when you live in the forest as a forest monk you see all the animals they they stop being afraid of you they start climbing on you i have frogs they jump on my face sits on my face they, they they're not afraid of me so they 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 can feel it in intuitively so 
so there's, if there's a lot of mosquitoes irritating you, it might be because an irritation that is basically dosa, hate, is a defilement of your mind that is of such a magnitude that you should do something systematically about it. And that is to do metta meditation, 45 minutes every morning then the mosquitoes will go off and you don't need to need to use mosquito oil or any kind of uh, other repellent. One can use other repellents also, but not something that is toxic that kill the other being or harm it in any way. This is uh, unsuitable because if you harm other beings in whatever way you do it, for whatever reason you're doing it, you will harm yourself also because of the karmic ego. So that's very bad business. Don't do that. Harmlessness, ahimsa, is a prime component because of this cause and effect issue. Now we have it, I'd just like to say a couple of words also about uh, being vegetarian because this is uh, usually an issue is that is coming up regarding this. Uh, Buddha was not a vegetarian, and I'm not a vegetarian either. I have been, but uh, I'm not anymore. And this is because you can eat food that is uh, from, the, uh, from the market is not allowed to eat meat for a monk uh, if it's seen, heard, or suspected that it is killed for your sake. But on the market, it's okay. What about then, but isn't it on the market, the butcher place, is this, isn't this just kind of like hired killers? And that's, that's an issue there. That, of course, those who are selling meat on the market, and it's actually regarded as wrong livelihood, is one is working a place where they sell meat, uh, and also poison and weapons. So this is wrong livelihood. It's an abrogation of the Noble Eightfold Path. But nevertheless, the Buddha wouldn't say. Uh, why wouldn't he say? There's two things that are important to know. Vegetarians are not innocent, because even though if you eat vegetarian food, if you see how many insects and worms that are killed, for uh, harvesting any kind of crop, they come in the hundred thousands because of use of pesticides, plowing, and so on. So even if you eat uh, ecological vegetarian food, there has been a significant amount of beings killed in order to produce this food. So the vegetarian is not innocent. So you can say, ah, what's then worst killing a uh, hundred thousand worms or one cow? Yes, it's difficult to say because 100,000 worms, they have a consciousness that are on a lower level, but still they have a consciousness. So there's a karmic echo. The cow has a larger, uh, you can say, more refined consciousness. So there the echo goes up, but if there's 100,000 worms, then uh, it's more like equal. Huh? So this means that it's actually, it, it, it shows to you that it's difficult to be on the planet Earth and sustain yourself with food and not thereby not, neither in any directly or indirect sense, cause other beings to be killed. That's really difficult. I would say it's impossible. It's impossible. I mean, wherever you step, there's insects. Buddha even further said that in whatever, in whatever grass or any kind of uh, plant, there will be beings, conscious beings living there. The plant itself is not conscious, important. The plant itself is not conscious. This you can cut down. But inside the plant is another being that is conscious, or can be. And they, they live inside the plant as we live inside our house. So they lose their house by the, cat, uh, the, the, the plant being cut down. And that's, of course, also a karmic issue. So it's not so easy to be f completely clean. The only way of going completely clean of not being involved in the killing of other beings, directly or indirectly, in the ultimate sense, is to go Nibbana. Because there you don't need food. And there's no other beings there in that sense that you can take any their space or their living place or harm them in any possible way. So that's just saying about this debate about vegetarian, non-vegetarian. This should be silenced because uh, it has nothing. It's not really a Buddhist issue because vegetarians are not innocent. 
uh, that's that's a wrong notion. It's because they just don't think about where their food is coming from and how it's harvested, how it's produced. Uh, then another issue uh, with why did the Buddha not? He was asked by Devadatta, why don't you say to your monks that they should become vegetarians? And I think I don't know. I think personally uh, that he did that's because. He already said that if you have to become a good Buddhist, you cannot drink alcohol. Then you have cut out 95% of, of the population. They cannot be good Buddhists because they cannot they cannot stay without alcohol. That's a main, major issue. Or drugs. They cannot be without alcohol or drugs. So if you at the same time say, okay, 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 you cannot only be a good Buddhist if you don't eat meat and you don't drink alcohol. Then you cut out 95% uh, of the last 5%. And that's cruel. Because then too many people will feel estranged. They will feel, I, c I cannot handle this issue. I cannot ha handle not eating meat and not uh, being allowed to drink a beer once in a while. I cannot handle it. This Buddhism is not something for me. It's too difficult. That's, I think that's what, why he said it. It makes sense. You can be without, uh, uh, you have to be without alcohol and drugs. That's handleable. But at the same time, also without meat, then it starts to be tricky. Then there's a, a, a there is a detail about why I'm saying that I think he said like that, and that is because I recently found out that all the Buddhas they die from eating a special kind of meat. Uh, it's kind of pork, pork together with mushrooms, some kind of mushrooms, as far as we can know from from the Pali text, that this dish was made out of that. And they choose to uh, die deliberately themselves by e eating this uh, dish. And I think there is a subtle statement, and actually, actually vegetarian statement there, that they, try, they, they deliberately choose to die from eating infected pork. You know, why do they do that? I, my only explanation is <laughs> that, that, that that's a sub, that's as far as as far as they can go to say a vegetarian issue. The vegetarian to eat the vegetarian food is good. That's as far as they can go. They truly say that death method. Uh, but this is my personal view. It's not something you can find in the text. Uh, this with the infected pork you can't find in the text. Uh, there's a sutta actually in the Dikkanikaya, where the whole death process of the Buddha in all detail is laid down. There you can you can read it for yourself. But why they do it? Why they choose that? Uh, they choose it deliberately. They know it three months in advance. Uh, what will happen? They 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 choose this as the 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 way to die. They they get basically they get dysentery. Diarrhea, severe diarrhea afterwards, uh, profuse diarrhea afterwards, bloody diarrhea, and so they die from that, from dehydration and bloody diarrhea. It could be salmonella infection, could be salmonella trophy, typhoid fever, could be other kinds of also dysteria. Many bacteria could be, but nevertheless they choose this infected pork. So. Uh, I think that's enough for the insects uh, and also the vegetarian issue. So the last question is, is there a way to prevent myself from backsliding in my practice? And backsliding is, uh, for example, that you have uh, quit smoking or something else like that, quit some other uh, unhealthy practice. I just like to say from a doctor's point of view, uh, this, sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, this meat issue. Uh, here in Sri Lanka, they eat two kilos meat per year per person. In Denmark, they eat 144 kilos per year per person. And uh, this is far, 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 far too much. It's basically you eat uh, two times your own body weight a year in meat. And here you eat something like five percent of your body. In, in meat. That's more more like it. So a little I think is okay. What we meet of eat meat today, especially regarding the way 
the excessively cruel, uh, painstakingly insane way that meat are produced in, in animal farms today, both chicken and pigs and cows, and how, how they are treated. It is so, it is so, it is so, it screams to the heaven how cruel human beings can be to produce this meat. So I recommend highly to cut it down. The way I did myself is to say first, no cow, then no pork, no cow, no pork, then only fish, no lamb, cut. So took it gradually over a year or two. Then, ah, okay, then we have only fish and bird. Then bird, no bird, then only fish. Then cut fish, then only eggs uh, and cheese. And now I come back to kind of like a middle way because I had disease. I have worms in my liver for a prolonged period, some years, and was kind of like a little unhealthy to look at. So I started eating meat again. Uh, now I take a little bit chicken and a little bit fish, but very, very little. And uh, I can say a month I will eat four cans of mackerel, four cans in one month. That's one can uh, per week. I think it's something like two spoonsful a day, and the same amount of chicken, two spoonsful a day, and that's enough. That's enough. So thereby you come down to something like maybe it's a little more than two kilos. I get it's kind of like maybe ten kilos a, a year in that order, uh, between ten and twenty kilos a year in that order, and that's a modest amount of meat. That's uh, also from a, a medical point of view, uh, much more healthy than eating these humongous amounts uh, of meat up in the 100 kilo range. You can look up in the statistics how much uh, meat they eat in your country. Uh, but 144 kilos is too much. I would say something like uh, per, 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 per capita per person in, in a country, 20 kilo, 30 kilo, 50 kilos at most, and that's reasonable. And but uh, 20 kilo, I say, is is probably around uh, around uh, the ideal. Okay, so and there I would recommend uh, no cow, no pork, no lamb, only bird and fish. Not taking any bigger animals than that. Okay, then it's back to backsliding. Uh, backsliding is to, to say you have, uh, you have, you have purified some practice, and then you go back. You, for example, you start meditating every day, every morning, and then you 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 give up meditating every morning. And the the uh, the classic cure against that is called reviewing, that you are looking back and you at your own practice and review it, and then keep. M keep noting and keep uh, reminding yourself that can be done by the daily emails I sent out to read the daily email so you never miss one and every day to to uh, come back to the daily meditation schedule there's also some uh, Zen monks they have a, a praxis they have two small uh, cups with white stones and black stones and then uh, when they do a bad thing, they take a black stone and put up in the daily cup. And when they take a, do a good thing, they take the white stone and put up in the daily cup. And then in the evening, they see how many white stones and how many black stones are in the daily cup. And then they sort them out. And, and, and this, this good is again an example of reviewing, re reviewing your own behavior. What did you do in the past? both on the long scale, very long scale, this life, more than one life. And also, what did you do yesterday? What did you do last year? What did you do 10 years ago? What was your practice 10 years ago? When your practice was good, how was it? And so you come back to see the ideal points, and also you reflect upon, if you have been backsliding, what made you backslide? What may, was it drugs or booze or stress or uh, divorce or problems in the family or economical problems or whatever 
what was it? What was the cause in induction? And there you learn something to come like, kind of like come back. But realizing that the backsliding is done by reviewing, it's when it's looking back, then one can see what is okay. One is sliding down, <laughs> sliding down uh, again, and becoming more primitive than one was before. One has a higher level of purity. Then one knows this purity. Then one can see the defilement seeps in by reviewing. Uh, usually it's seen on a little longer scale in the range of weeks or months one can see but it's this reviewing and reminding oneself about the importance of the practice this is usually uh, the importance of the practice is, is usually done by a concept called samvega it's, it has been well translated in my opinion to a sense of urgency and how to understand that? Yeah, this, it takes only one action to end up in the barbecue. One action, two actions. And that's how much it can take from the balance to tip at the moment of death. So one sees that I don't know. Since I don't know my karmic accumulation from the distant past, I have no idea what I've accumulated. I'm human now, that, that's, that's, that's obvious. But I have no idea of what karma I've done in the past that has not ripened yet, that has not come into action yet. So I don't know what's on my karmic bank account. So I can only improve it here. So this makes one feel a sense of urgency, that it's kind of like there's an unseen bank account. You don't know whether it's positive or negative. You don't know. What you do know is that when you come to the moment of death, then suddenly this bank account comes into play because it will determine the rebirth destination, whether one is going down to, to the level of uh, animal level or lower uh, ghost level or even hell level. And that's, that's dangerous. In the true sense of that word, is dangerous. Uh, because this this torture is un inexpressible, uh, and the pain there, even at 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 most animal levels, most animals don't uh, have a natural death. They are being eaten by other animals. They live their entire life in fear because of that fact. They know they will be eaten, killed and eaten alive. So they live in fear, and this is should should, should use to. Induce this sense of urgency in yourself, some vega. Again and again and again and again. Say, ah, come on, come on, come on. It's now, it's not tomorrow. The problem is you think you have time. No, there's no time. Time is now. And it keeps on being now, forever, until you reach Nibbana. There is no time. Then you can relax. Then you ha the job is done. You can put down the burden. But not before that then keep up this sense of urgency. <gasps> the Buddha said, they asked him, how, how acute should this sense of urgency be? He said, you should try to reach enlightenment as, as quickly as you can take the spoon out of your mouth. Or you should see like that, and you should feel like it's a man, he has a, a, a bowl of oil on his head, and he has to go into a big, a big uh, crowd of people. Because, and there's a dang, there's a beautiful lady dancing inside there in this crowd of people, and he has to go to this uh, uh, through this crowd of people without spilling a drop of oil, and the 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 the, the bowl of oil is full to the brim, and right after him is four people. They have swords and they're very sharp and they have raised their swords, and the moment they see he spill one drop of oil, chop, they chop off his head. That's, a, that's how acute you should think about it. One drop of oil. You spill one drop of oil. Chop! So, uh, Buddha put emphasis on this acuteness, this samvega, about feeling the danger, antinava, coming up from behind. Huh? What's the danger that's coming up from behind? Yeah, that's like five serial killers with their weapons ready. It's sense desire. It's hate. It's laziness, literally and laziness. It's restlessness and worries and it's doubt and uncertainty. That's the killers coming up from behind. Five of them. 
So there's no time to put your head on the pillow of complacency. No, 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 no. It's right high, right here. And it's right now, right here, forever. Until you're finished with the job. Some weaker. So again, reviewing, reviewing your own practice, looking back, re-evaluating. It goes without say, saying that will improve it. And then this some vega sense of urgency. Is now. It's now. It's now. It's now. You never know when it's too late. You never know when you will be killed, get a stroke, get unable to practice. You never know. It's now. Therefore, it's now. Do it while you can. Ah, then there's some other issues. I think that was the six questions for today. Uh, otherwise, I would say I'm happy at heart with this uh, Dhamma on air. The, there was a thousand viewers on the first one, and there's 500 viewers on the on the third one now. But it's growing, and I think it's a, it's a good practice because these questions are relevant for all Buddhists, and so they can be through this social media has one YouTube channel and one Vimeo channel. And I put them on both channels, and so they will. Uh, the numbers of increase. Remember to subscribe. Down there or there, I can remember the side. I think it's down there actually. Press subscribe. I put a subscribe button within the video itself. Should be easy. Then there's another issue. It's the technical quality is not not entirely uh, good. Uh, I'm recording this on a webcam, and and it has to be. A, a, a good quality because then you can adjust the light. But uh, as you see, sometimes also uh, during this session, the autofocus is, is kind of like slipping out. So if you want to, if anyone wants to help you me with uh, improving the technical quality of this, then what is needed is uh, this uh, this webcam is the newest one. It's called Logitech C930E webcam, and there's a new model, brand new model which you can uh, manually adjust uh, the gain and the exposure and the brightness and so on. It's important that, and that model number is here. Uh, so Logitech C930E webcam model this one, in with 72, uh, and cost around 130 bucks on uh, Amazon now. Uh, uh, the old model cost around 100 bucks, uh, but uh, this model will, will be the ideal. Uh, because it has more rapid autofocus and still it has a, also, also a way of, of uh, choosing the light. I can show you. Uh, I can I can change the exposure like that. So I can uh, get the ideal setting. But uh, this this C930, the old model, the, this has a kind of like right light 2 technology that is cannot be taken off manually. So you can adjust it manually, and then it will change uh, all the way, drift around. Uh, but uh, so if, if anybody then send me an email, bande uh, at gmail dot com, and then I, c I can give you my address if you if you wish so. Uh, then there was maybe one more. I said, ah, that's Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. May all beings be thus happy. Thereby. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy Honorable and perfectly self-enlightened is the blessed Buddha. A very Fustendi complete or perfect set of blues at Vesina Buddha. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>